In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said those things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God. Well, let's pray together. Father, we know that we encounter God when we read his word. And so, Father, we have our Bibles open in front of us, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will teach us and will apply your word to our lives and to our hearts. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we're looking at the fourth day that changed the world, the ascension of Christ. We're looking at the historical events of the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. As we start here in the book of Acts, uh, let me just give you a brief introduction by going straight away down uh, three uh, side roads. Uh, which, which really help us to understand the book of Acts. And what about reading the book of Acts this week? There are 28 chapters, and if you read four chapters per day, you'll get through the book of Acts by, by next Sunday. Probably take you 10, 15 minutes. Uh, some of you who read quickly, perhaps five minutes, and you can read about how the church started and uh, the early church and how God created and formed the foundation of the church, uh, which is our history. So uh, why don't you read the book of Acts uh, this coming week? Four chapters per day, that's not too much, um, and see how God worked and how the gospel grew from Jerusalem uh, right up to Rome, uh, which was the capital of the world. So to help you, just three of the purposes that uh, Luke had. Luke was the author, and uh, he had three clear purposes in writing the book of Acts. Um, the book of Acts is really a pivotal book when it comes to the New Testament because after you've read the Gospels, you say, what happened next? Well, the answer is the book of Acts. That's what happened next. When you read the epistles, the letters of Peter and James and John, uh, you say, where did those churches come from? And the answer is the book of Acts. It tells you where those churches came from. So the book of Acts is a history of the early church. In act, it's, it's actually Church History 101. So one of Luke's great purposes is to give us this historical account of Jesus and the person of Jesus and the life of Jesus and then the growth of the church of Jesus. Notice chapter 1, verse 1. Luke writes, he says, in the first book, so notice that, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So... The person who's Luke writing this book tells us that he's written two books. And the first book was the Gospel of Luke. And now he's written the book of Acts. So Acts is volume two of a two-volume work. And both volumes deal with the origins of the Christian faith. Let's turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. We've often looked at this passage. 
but uh, some of you may be new to our church, and it's important that you understand what Luke is actually trying to do, both in his gospel and in the book of Acts. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. And what we have in these four verses is really a preface to both volumes. He's, uh, he's giving us a prologue. He's giving us a preface. He's, he's giving us an introduction to volume one, the gospel, and volume two, the book of Acts. And uh, you'll notice that Luke is particularly concerned that he conveys accurate historical fact. So notice his methodology. He, he actually tells us what his research and his writing methodology was in writing these two volumes. Verse 1, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. There's the same gentleman. That you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So he's writing to Theophilus, volume 1, volume 2. We're not quite sure who Theophilus was. He may have been some uh, high-standing government official. But he gives us his methodology. Just notice very quickly, he had a research methodology. And there were five stages. Stage 1, verse 1, they were the historical events, the things that have been accomplished among us the historical events. Stage two is that there were eyewitnesses to those events, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. Stage three, what does Luke do? He goes and he does research. He talks to them. He interviews them. He writes down their answers. He compares their answers to one another. He does personal research. It seemed good to me also, verse 3, having followed all things closely for some time past. So he does his research. Stage four, notice, he then writes down his findings. So he's not just, uh, he's not just uh, thumb-sucking. Uh, no, he's done his research. He's talked to hundreds of eyewitnesses, people who were there, who saw the miracles of Christ, who heard the teachings of Christ. He's talked to them. Now he's writing it down, stage four. Stage five, he writes it to Theophilus and to us so that we may understand what happened, that you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. So Luke is acutely conscious that, uh, that his readers need to understand that what he's writing about is not some myth, it's not some philosophy, it's not some spiritual thinking or experience. No, he wants to give us the history of the person of Christ and then the growth of the church of Christ. That's what he wants to do. And he's very concerned about history. He's very concerned that it's accurate. Just quickly, I'll give you one example. Chapter 3, verse 1. He's very concerned about time, about place, about topography, about geography, about architecture, about location. So there's always an eye for detail in time and place. And you'll just get a taste of that in chapter 3, verse 1. Now, it's important that we understand that when we look at the ascension of Christ. Because many people say that's a myth. You can't actually believe it. No, Luke's purpose is to give us the historical facts. That's his purpose. And it's everywhere in both volumes. Chapter 3, verse 1. Now, you can't get more detailed than this. He says, in, 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 in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysasius tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. I mean, you can't get more detail than that, can you? In fact, archaeological discoveries have shown that every one of those details are accurate. There's been debate, there's been discussion, there's been argument, because some of those leaders, uh, their, their reign kind of crossed over. And, um, but it's been shown to be absolutely accurate. And that's what Luke wants to do. He wants to give us historical fact. He's concerned about the truth. 
So that's important for us because there are some times when you perhaps lie awake at night and you think to yourself, how do I know it's true? How, how do I know that those people at Christchurch Midrand aren't brainwashing me? How do, how do I know that Martin is an occult leader? Um, I mean, how do I know that? How do I know it's true? My friends laugh at me. My family think I'm stupid. Well, Luke says, no, no, no. What I'm giving you is the historical fact, the truth. This is historically true. It's objectively true whether you believe it or not. So that's what he's saying. So it's a little bit like we all know that in 1994, Nelson Mandela became the president of our country. Now, whether you believe it or not, it happened. It's not based upon your belief. It's got nothing to do with your belief. It happened. It's true. That's what Luke is saying here. Whether you believe it or not, and hopefully you do, but whether you believe it or not isn't the issue. It happened. It's true. And that's the basis of our Christian faith. The facts, the person of Christ, the historical person. Secondly, just quickly have a look back to Acts chapter 1. There's a historical purpose. And secondly, there's a, there's a Christological purpose. That means it focuses on Christ. A Christological purpose. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So Luke doesn't regard the gospel as telling us about Jesus and then the book of Acts telling us about the church. No, he doesn't. What he has here in these two volumes are the two stages of the ministry of the same Jesus. So volume one tells us about Jesus' ministry on earth, exercised personally, publicly. Volume two tells us about Jesus' ministry from heaven through the Spirit, through the apostles, and through the Word. So in volume one, Theophilus, I told you what Jesus began to do. Now I'm going to tell you what Jesus continues to do through the apostles and through his spirit. It's the same Jesus who is working both in the gospel and in the book of Acts. Which means that Christ's ministry didn't end with his, his ascension. No, he continues his ministry. In fact, he's here with us today. By his spirit, unseen, invisible, the spirit of God is here. Especially when we gather as God's people around his word, God is here. Imagine that, God is here. His ministry didn't end with his ascension. So we believe in both the historical Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago in Palestine and also the contemporary Jesus who is here with us this morning talking to us, convicting us, encouraging us. Just quickly, thirdly, there's a kingdom purpose throughout, throughout the book of Acts. Notice what Jesus did in the 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. That's about six weeks. Verse 3 tells us that he, was, that, that he spent 40 days giving them many convincing proofs that he was alive. And if you missed the uh, talk on the resurrection last Sunday, you need to download that because there were hundreds of witnesses. They weren't all strange people or quirky people or people who have hallucinations. Um, you know those kind of people. I'm sure there are none here this morning. Um, <laughs> but I mean, we all know they're crazy people. You, you know, your in-laws. They, they, <laughs> they, they, they they have all kinds of... No, what, what Luke tells us in, uh, in his gospel is there were proof. And Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 15, check that out. There were hundreds of people who saw Jesus at the same time. There's proof, there's evidence. Go and check it out. In fact, go and talk to them and ask them. So that's what Jesus did in those 40 days. And there were two things in particular he talked about. Verse 3, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Notice there... Verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. The second thing he talked about was the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 and 5, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. 
not many days from now. So those were the two main topics of conversation that Jesus talked about in those 40 days, about, about the kingdom of God and about the Holy Spirit. And verse 8 actually brings those two concepts together. Because Jesus says, I will give you the Holy Spirit so that you may spread the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Notice that verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. What is the purpose of that power? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, for us to apply that command to ourselves, which we need to, it's important to understand that third, certain things stay the same, but certain things are different. What is different? First of all, we are not apostles, right? None of us are apostles. The apostles were people who saw the visible Christ, the visible resurrected Christ. Pick that up at the end of Acts chapter 1. To be an apostle, you had to be there, so they're no longer apostles, the second thing is we don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit like the disciples. Well, it's kind of obvious. The disciples lived before. Here's the death, resurrection, ascension of Christ and Pentecost. They lived here. They had to wait for Pentecost. So he says you have to wait for the Holy Spirit. We live after Pentecost. We don't have to wait for his death, resurrection, ascension, Pentecost. We live after Pentecost. We receive the Holy Spirit when we are born again. When you become a Christian, you receive the Holy Spirit. That's why you have new loves, you have new hates, your values have changed, your thinking has changed. What is that? That's the work of the Holy Spirit, changing you from within. Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You must be born again. John chapter, th John chapter 3. So we receive this Holy Spirit. We don't have to wait like they did. No, we live after Pentecost. We receive the Holy Spirit when we are born again. The command remains the same, however, in that we are to be witnesses. So witness, though we didn't see the physical resurrected Christ, we have experienced God changing our lives, changing our minds, our hearts, God changing our families. And so we are to be witnesses of that. We are to tell other people. And we are to do so, he says, they're in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, that doesn't mean we have to relocate. You can stay in Joburg. What it means is you must share the gospel where you are, which was Jerusalem. You must share the gospel in Judea, which was the province of Jerusalem. You must share the gospel in the neighboring country or province, which was Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So for what? So for us, what does that mean? Well, the capital of Gauteng is Midrand. So we must share the gospel <laughs> in Midrand. We must share the gospel in Gauteng. We must share the gospel in Limpopo. And we must share the gospel to the ends of the earth. Now, sometimes people say to me, so it's important that we notice that verse 8. They say to me, Martin, why are we concerned about planting churches and getting the gospel out to Mozambique or Zimbabwe or the DRC or Tanzania. We've got enough problems here. Well, of course we have enough problems here. But the health of a church, Jesus knew that, the health of a church and the health of a Christian is when you're not just inward looking, me and my little problems. No, the health of a church is where we share the gospel in Midrand, in Tembisa, uh, in South Africa and to other countries, to the ends of the earth. That is what Jesus said. So it's, not, so it's never either or. It's never either or. It's always both and. We share the gospel where we are, and we share the gospel to the ends of the earth. All right, let's uh, quickly have a look. I'm more than halfway, so take heart. I'm more than halfway. Let's have a look at three things about the ascension of Christ. Now we understand something of the purpose of why Luke was writing. He had a clear purpose. He had a clear reason for writing. He had a clear agenda. He didn't just jot down his ideas here. This is a carefully researched document. And now he tells us about the ascension of Christ. Notice three things. First of all, he makes it quite clear that Christ's body ascended physically into heaven. He makes that very clear, verse 9. And when he had said these things, 
as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, remember, Luke is a historian. He's trying to be accurate, factual. And there have been many people, even inside the church, who have denied the historicity of the ascension of Christ. Some have argued that Luke lived in a pre-scientific age, and so we need to strip this quaint story of its primitive mythology. And um, it's just a myth of a prehistoric liftoff. Five, four, three, two, one, liftoff. William Neal, a theologian who didn't go to George Woodford College, of course, um, he said, I quote, it would be a grave misunderstanding of Luke's purpose to regard his account of the ascension of Christ as other than symbolic and poetic, end of quote. Now, re with respect to Mr. Neal, he is dead wrong because Paul's, uh, not Paul, Luke's purpose was very clearly to give us factual information. So, in fact, he stresses four times in those three verses, 9 to 11, he stresses four times that there were eyewitnesses. So he's actually not talking about a myth. He's not talking poetry. This is not poetry, Mr. Neal. No, he's talking about eyewitnesses. So, I mean, you may not agree with him, but that is what he's telling us. Notice there verse 9. It comes up twice. While they were gazing into heaven as he went. So they're gazing. Behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Verse 11, and said, men of Galilee. Now, I, where did I go? Verse 9. Okay, verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, notice that, there were eyewitnesses. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. So twice in that one verse, he mentions they were eyewitnesses. Verse 10a, he mentions it once again. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went. Verse 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? So, I mean, it's quite clear that uh, Luke is affirming it's not poetic, it's not a myth, it's not, it's not a pre-scientific takeoff. No, I'm giving you factual, historical information. And the apostles were eyewitnesses. So what that tells us is that the Christian faith is both historical and it is supernatural. So those are not opposites. Surely God can do supernatural things if he's God. If he created the laws of nature, surely he can work outside of the laws of nature. He's not bound by the laws of nature. No, he's God. And this is his son. This is the Messiah. This is the king. So it is supernatural. I mean, it would be quite unreasonable to say that God couldn't do supernatural things. I don't think that would be reasonable at all. Of course he can. He's God. Now, what does the ascension mean to us? Let me just mention two quick things. The, the first is, it means that his work is completed. So it's kind of the final full stop on the work of Christ. So Christ came primarily to die in our place, to rescue us from the wrath of God and the judgment of God, to be our substitute. And we remember that, especially on Good Friday that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and so he offers us forgiveness. And this is a kind of a full stop in narrative form, in historical form. The job is done. I'm going back to my Father, and so you have the ascension. The second thing is that it affirms that Jesus actually is the Lord, the King, the Messiah. He actually is God because he doesn't die. He died, God rose him, raised him from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he's alive right now, seated at the right hand of God, extending his ministry through his word and through his spirit throughout the world. He's king, he's lord. So we use no numerous terms in becoming a Christian, and there's nothing wrong with any of them, inviting Jesus into my heart, making a commitment to Christ, putting my faith in Christ. But at the bottom line, it's submitting to Jesus as king, saying, I'm no longer king. you king. I'm finite. I'm mortal. He is infinite. He's immortal. He's eternal. It's no longer my ideas or values that count. 
What does the king say? Secondly, let's have a look at the fact that not only did Christ's body physically ascend into heaven, but notice here, and Luke makes quite a point of it, that Christ ascended to a place. Verse 9. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Verse 11. The angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So he uses the word heaven there four times. Jesus went to a place, to a location called heaven. So he didn't just vaporize into thin air. He didn't just become some ethereal spirit that sort of floats around and you can, you can pick up the spirit of Jesus here or there. No, no, no. He went to a place. He ascended to a place called heaven. And you'll notice there, verse 10 and 11, the word heaven there is used four times. Verse 10, he ascended as they were gazing into heaven. And then verse 11, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way as you saw him going, going into heaven. So heaven is a place. Now, of course, we don't know where it is. We can't see it with our eyes, but it is a, certainly a place. It's a location. It's a spiritual place because it's beyond time and space. It's beyond the limitations of what you can see and touch and smell and hear. But it is a place, a spiritual place. Remember what Jesus said. Just quickly turn to John chapter 14, verse 1. He talked about the same thing. And actually he said, just as Jesus ascended into heaven with a spiritual body, we will ascend into heaven. That's what he tells us, John chapter 14. So, so it's not just the ascension of Christ. It's what will happen with us. We will ascend into heaven. Chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. I mean, isn't that a good phrase? Our hearts are so often troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So, I mean, here's the great hope and certainty of the Christian faith, that one day we'll be with him. One day we'll be out of this broken world. Do you know that all of us have a temporary visa? I mean, you may have a passport, and you spend two days standing at home affairs to get the passport, but don't worry about the passport. You've only got a temporary visa. Maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe 12 months, who knows? All of us. We've only got a temporary visa because this is not our home. I mean, isn't that good news? This is not our home. I'm so pleased. One day we'll be out of here. I'll be going home. This is not my home. This is just a temporary training ground before we get to our eternal destination. That's the great certainty. That's the great hope of the Christian faith. And it's not a kind of a mythical hope. I wish, I hope. No, there's a certainty. Christ was raised from the dead. Christ ascended into heaven. Those who trust in Christ will be raised from the dead, will, will ascend into heaven and be with Christ. Some of us have lost loved ones. People sometimes ask me, not so much anymore, they ask me, are your parents still alive? And the reason they don't ask me that question is because they see how old I am. <laughs> and I say to them, my parents are very much alive. They died about 10, 15 years ago, but, but at a late stage in their life, they came to Christ. And one day I'll see them. And I think of other people I know, some who died tragically and sadly. And I think to myself, they'll be there. You've lost, perhaps you've tragically lost, lost a child, 
Perhaps you've had a miscarriage. Perhaps you've had a stillborn child like Jean and I had. Perhaps there's been a parent, someone you loved dearly, and there was a painful death, a tragic death, and you grieve, and of course we grieve. But if they trusted in Christ, and who knows what went through people's minds before they died, it's not for us to say who's in heaven or who's not. We'll be with them if they trusted in Christ. I mean, isn't that a wonderful thought? I've thought of, thought of a whole bunch of people who, who are in heaven, and I'm so looking forward to seeing them, being with them, being with my mom and dad, being with our stillborn child, and being there forever. That's the great certainty of the Christian faith. It doesn't just end with death. Energy, I'm told in physics, I know nothing about physics, but you cannot, you cannot eradicate energy. It's got to be displaced. It's got to go into something else. Well, when you die, it's not just nothing. No. You will be resurrected, and you'll be with the Lord. That's our hope. And that is a great hope, especially when your heart is troubled. When things are bad. And sometimes things are bad. Sometimes we have a bad year. I look back at the last three months. It hasn't been an easy three months. I don't know about you. I think for most of us. It hasn't been easy. It's been a rough three months. And I think to myself, we've still got the rest of nine months to go. But then I remember heaven, the resurrection. That's our hope. All right, let's lastly have a look. Time's nearly gone. Time has gone. He talks about not just the ascension of Christ, but the return of Christ. Back to Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Verse 10, Acts chapter 1, And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you in heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So the first thing just to notice here is the angels, two men in white robes. And uh, throughout the Bible, there are angels. Do you know that? Just as there are evil spirits, who are unseen, but they have power, and we all know that. Read the Gospels, you see the power of evil spirits, and they are the messengers of Satan. So they are angels, they are created beings, they are God's agents, and they work unseen, invisible. Occasionally they appear as they do in this passage. Now, we may smile at angels, but the Bible is very clear about it. There are angels who look after us. So think of some event in your life where, where you were millimeters away from a tragedy and something happened. Could that not have been an angel? With your kind of driving, the fact that you got to church this morning. <laughs> people tell me, because of the way I drive, that when I pick up the car keys, a thousand angels are woken up from their beds and said, you better get down there because we want to get Martin from A to B. Here the angels are, and they are speaking. And uh, they, they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from into heaven will come back in the same way. Now we need to be careful not to think that the, that the return of Christ will be a film of his ascension played backwards. It will not be at exactly the same spot, and he probably won't be wearing the same clothes. So this same Jesus means this same Jesus, the personal Jesus, the supernatural Jesus, the Jesus with a glorified body. But there will be some differences between his going and his coming. So his going was reasonably private. Only the 11 were there, but his second coming will be public. Because we are told in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, that every eye will see him. So it won't be private. Now, I don't know how God will pull that off, because we live in a round world. 
So, I mean, how is every eye going to see him? And as you know, in Australia, they're already living in tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, God has pulled off all kinds of other things successfully without your or my help. So I'm sure he'll be able to pull that one off. But every eye will see him. His going was alone, but he will return with millions of angels as a retinue. His going was localized in Palestine, but his return will be universal, for every eye will see him. So we are to live in the light of eternity. We are here, we're living here, but there's an end. Your temporary visa will end. And the question is, where will you go? We are to live in the light of eternity and not get too tied up with the luggage and the baggage because it's only temporary. Our purpose should be to serve the king, the king who has risen, who has ascended, who is working amongst us even now through his spirit. We should think through, some of you have not been right with God. You've drifted from God. You've been walking in the dark, in the shadows. My dear friend, you need to get right with God because you don't know when that visa will expire. You don't know. And let me tell you, there's no joy if you live for yourself. You can have temporary happiness, but you'll never find joy. We are to live in the light of eternity, in, in the light of our own death and the light of the, of the return of Christ. Well, let's pray. Father, again, we pray that you will forgive us, all of us, when our focus is so much on this world and particularly on ourselves. We pray that we may live for the King. And if we've been the King of our own lives, will you help us to take off the throne and to bow the knee to King Jesus? And Lord, remind us again what the purpose of it all is. It's to live for the King. It's to love the King. It's to tell others about the King. It's to long for that day when we'll be with the King. But Lord, will you help us to be ready and not to put it off another day. Father, go with us into this week. Help us to live in the light of eternity. Help us to serve you wherever you've placed us. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen.